Today, I'm going to be covering the top 10 worst moments of the Animal series, in my opinion. Disclaimer, whatever. Now, before everyone says, oh, you're so bloody negative, this is in lead up to Wednesday's video, the next video I'll be doing on this channel, which will be the top 10 best moments. So we're getting the rubbish out of the way before we get the top 10 best moments out on Wednesday. But yeah, this is gonna frustrate me a little bit, I reckon. The moments in this list are here mostly because they annoyed the heck out of me. They made me want to rip things up. One of the books did get ripped up. <laughs> And that one's in this list twice. But um, yeah, I had to narrow it down from 12. So there's going to be two bonus ones I'll reveal before I reveal my number one least favourite moment of the series. Overall, the series is great, but sometimes it did have its bad moments. And at number 10, we have a moment from this book, The Illusion. Throughout the second half of this book, Tobias is being tortured but he's not really giving up any information. And then he utters a couple of comments about Taylor, the torturer, being very pretty, and suddenly she spills the beans on everything. Who the hell's being tortured here? It was one of the reasons why Taylor is my least favorite character, probably of the whole series. Just an awful, awful character. Just weak, unintimidating, and downright silly. And this was probably the worst Taylor moment of the entire two books she was in. The Subvisor snorted derisively. He needs me. I'm his expert on humans. He has lots of human controllers. Not like me, she yelled, flying into a sudden rage. I'm a voluntary. Do you know what? Do you know that? This girl, this human, chose this life, chose to invite me in to take control. Why? Why? Because she'd seen humans as they truly were. She chose us over her own people. Why? Because humans are weak and petty and stupid and we will rule them all and we will make them ours, all of them. She was shaking from rage, from fear. A human would have to be very weak and foolish to turn against her own, I said. I had no idea what I was saying, no idea what kind of twisted person I was dealing with. She seemed to make no sense. I was throwing anything out there saying anything, anything to keep her going, talking, away from the button. And then she does carry on talking. And yeah, basically, for all this book, Tobias is being tortured, and then it, it's as if she was the one being tortured. It, the book was crap, and that was not quite the worst moment from the book, as we'll find out in a little bit. There's definitely up there. Number nine comes from this book, number 17, The Underground. There are a few bad moments in this one, one of them being Cassie suddenly appearing in front of Rachel. Literally, in the book, it's basically written as, and suddenly Cassie was there in front of me. Yeah, that's a pretty bad moment, but it's not as offensive to my sensibilities as what happens shortly after. Remember that this is a very tense situation. They've just fallen into the Yerk pool, the place that nobody ever wants to go into, where there's all this tension, and everything is torture and horrible. So you think it'd be pretty high stakes and everyone would, one would be, you know, trying their best and being serious about these things. Cassie and I banged through folded chair, folding chairs and slammed around tables loaded with interrupted meals. Back there, I yelled, pointing to a door. I yanked it open, a food pantry. And there, sitting calmly on top of a crate of canned minestrone and enjoying a banana, sat a gorilla. Marco? No, some other gorilla, he said. I've been trying to contact you for... And it carries on. He's sitting there eating a banana. Ridiculous. So it's, if anybody could have just come in. It, Rachel and Cassie came in, but if... You know, Visafree and his cronies walked in. There's Marco, sat in the middle of the room. Bang. Gone. Bye, Marco. Why is he doing that? It just completely removed any tension at all from this scene. He's just, it's, it's funny, haha, <laughs> funny stuff down in the yurt pool where everyone's being tortured. <clears throat> silly, silly book and a silly, silly moment. That's why it's at number nine. Number eight comes from book 32, The Separation. Rachel has been split into nice Rachel and mean Rachel. And a large part of Rachel's character arc is not so much the battle of 
for leadership with Jake, sort of, but her challenging his style of leadership and being a lot more aggressive, a lot more aggro. And now that mean Rachel is this fully fleshed being, she starts to have a fight with Jake. And it actually, when I was reading this book, I was thinking, we might get something really interesting here, seeing how Jake reacts. And then this happened. She leapt, landed on her hands, flew through the air and landed feet first against Marco's chest. Marco landed very hard on his back. Rachel was astride him, squatting on his chest. Her knees pinned his arms. She reached back his head and grabbed a handful of his dark hair. The other hand was balled into a fist, quivering about half a metre from Marco's face. Shut up, mean Rachel snapped. Don't make me kill you. Now you, little girl, you have about three seconds to tell us. Don't threaten, Jake said with unmistakable authority. Mean Rachel forgot me in a flash. She rounded on Jake. Don't get in my way, Jake. Don't push it, Rachel. Are you threatening me? She nearly screamed. Come on, you think you can tell me what to do? Let's go, right now. You and me. Just keep our pet and light here out of the fight. You and me. We'll see who's giving orders around here after I give you the butt kicking you're begging for. At this point, you think, shit's going down now. And this is going to be a real challenge for Jake's leadership, for Rachel's aggressiveness. <clears throat> The possible fight was interrupted at this point by the arrival of Eric King. Fuck you, Eric! And then the, the thing with Jake is just forgotten. It's just gone. All that tension build up, gone. Because Eric just sauntered in like a little twat head. I hated that moment. That was the worst part of this book, and the book is the, one of the worst moments of the series. So, here it is on number eight on my list. Number seven on the list comes from the first of these two books, The Absolutes, the one with Marco Morphing, the mallard. They stole a tank, right? And they took that tank and, you know, they escaped the Yerks and whatnot. And then the destroyed an innocent person's house. Let's read. The tank, I took a breath. Well, you know Chapman's house, nice two-storey. Jake sighed. How many stories is it now? Uh, I glanced at Tobias. Zero, but the back deck will give Chapman a nice supply of firewood this winter. It's already piled up for him. Tobias smiled. Too bad he doesn't have a fireplace anymore. Excuse me, said Rachel. You flattened Melissa's house. She stared at me. She and Melissa Chapman used to be friends, back before Melissa's dad became a controller and Rachel became an animorph. She turned on Tobias. And you went along with it? Whoa, down girl, I said. You're just mad because you didn't get to drive a tank. Nobody got hurt, nobody was home, not even Fluffer McNutter or whatever that stupid cat's name is. Fluffer McKitty, she said. Oh, excuse me, Fluffer McKitty. That's so much better. Anyway, they're all fine. Melissa, her parents, her cat. Tobias nodded. They're just, well, homeless. My good friend Raptor actually disagrees with me. He's fine with this moment, but me? I just think it is an act of pure evil, which I just don't like from the Animorphs. This is one of the few times on the list where I don't think it's a poor writing problem. I think it's a poor characterization problem. I think there's another time in this list. In fact, yeah, there is. But the fact that Marco and Tobias just flattened Melissa's house, and they're all sort of, oh, ha ha, let's make, let's just joke about the fact that we've flattened presumably an innocent person's house and made her homeless. That's just evil. And I d just didn't like that. It didn't feel right. And it was a crap book anyway, so <laughs> Yeah. It belonged in this book, funnily enough. But yeah, I detested that moment. Sorry. Number six on the list, and this is the next character moment, which I thought was very, very bad. And it comes from what was otherwise a good book, the Pretender, and in fact, this book, this part of the book really ruined the rest of it for me. Who is Tobias? Well, we find out in this book that he is in fact Elfangor's son. Who did Elfangor run afoul of in the very first book? It was Esplin, 9466, or Visser 3. Visser 3 is a cackling maniac who shows no mercy to anybody, is very vengeful, and doesn't really care about innocence or anything like that. And he loves to stoke up his own ego. So when Tobias, who Visser Three knows is Elfangor's son, is in his grasp, 
What do you think would be the logical thing to happen? Well, there's a few logical choices. The first would be he would kill him outright, which I think is the less likely situation. The other would be to make him a controller and subject him to a life of suffering. The third option would be to put him in his blade ship's torture chamber and just torture him because he's an evil twat. Those are the three things I'd suspect would happen. But no, not one of those three, three things happen. What does happen? I threw at my hands. Good grief, you're as crazy as he was. I walked out and closed the door behind me. I heard De Groot say, shouldn't we take him just to be safe, make him one of us? Arya snorted derisively. That's Visser 3, by the way. He's street trash, a waste of a yerk. Elfangor would be ashamed. His son should be a warrior, a worthy adversary, not some young fool. A pity, really. He just lets him go. Visser 3, let Elfangor's son go. He says he's a waste of a yerk. Remember Karen from Book 19, like a six-year-old girl? What use is she going to be? Why was she a yerk? <laughs> so, I don't freaking know. What a waste of a yerk Elfangor's son would be. No! Bollocks, Visser 3. That's not in character. And that's why this is number six on my little list. Number five comes from another book that was a complete letdown. Number 45, The Revelation. There are a few moments again in this one that could have landed on this list, but the one that I chose came from near the end. They're in the Yerk pool. They've gone in there. And Visser 3 has morphed a big flying uh, Beelvard or whatever, a big flying thing. And the, half the team are in dire straits. They're, oh no, we're about to be attacked by this thing. Now, usually it, in Animorphs, you do get a fair few deus ex machinas, but they're usually relatively small scale or harmless. This is deus ex bugfighter. There was no escape. No escape. I tried to lift both Rachel and my mother. They shuddered and gasped with pain. My attempt was pathetic. My injuries made me too weak to do anything. Suddenly, zoo, a bugfighter zoomed out from behind a storage building. Zoo! A Dracon blast right into the B. Villard's belly. A bug ship zoomed out from behind a storage building. What the fuck? <laughs> that, that is the single worst deus ex machina in the whole series, in my opinion. Just how? 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 He just sort of crept his little bog fighter behind this building and just waited for that perfect moment. Right, they're about to be killed. Now! <laughs> Go! <laughs> Do! <laughs> nah, it's bollocks, mate, isn't it? And that's why you're at number five. Is there any surprise that this book, number 37, The Weakness, would end up on this list at some point? Well, it's at number four. And... The amount of moments that could have been... I, I tried to... I didn't want every... <laughs> didn't want every point on this list to be from this book. So, at number four is the moment where they decide how they're going to get Cassie back. And Rachel asks Tobias, what Yerk pool entrances do you know? By the way, we've got 65 minutes to get Cassie back, so we're running on limited time. What Yerk pool entrances do we know? And he lists off a few. I'm not going to read this, by the way, because it's stretched over a couple of pages of nonsense. So I'm just going to tell you what happens. So Twilight says, oh, we've got this one, that one, that one, and that one. So Rachel says, have we got anything else? Uh, I mean, there might be one in the Mr. Bean Tower. Seriously, it's called Bean Tower. There might be one there. It might not be. But it might. Let's do it. What the fuck book? Don't make me rip you again. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's that book. That's how much I liked it. And it was one of those moments. Here are our options. We've got 65 minutes. Let's pick an option that probably won't work. Just that sums up the whole book, really. If you want that book summed up, just that moment. That moment. Or is there another moment? Let's carry on with the list. Number three 
and this is the first time a book has appeared twice on this list. And we've got this book back again. Number 33, The Illusion. So we've already covered what something terrible that happened in the second half of this book. What about the first half of this book? So the animals are at a meeting of the sharing and they want to get into a community centre. And Jake comes up with a plan. He's going to sneak in through the back. Okay. That's the only way they can get in. And Tobias is going to swoop in. So let's read how this happens. Jake and Axe parted ways. Jake went round the back of the community centre building, back away from the lights. He tried two of the doors, both locked. He stepped away into the darkness and reappeared a moment later, carrying a breeze block, part of the leftover debris of construction. He stood there, waiting. I flew above, waiting. He didn't look up. He knew I was there. All clear, Jake, I said. He nodded, then he swung the breeze block into a low window. The tinkling of glass was swallowed up in the booming sound of the MC's voice announcing the next honoree. Jake stepped away quickly. I took aim on the shattered glass. Plenty of room for me, if I folded my wings. More than enough room for the others, once they found their way there. Down I flew, down through the cold, dark air, focusing on the glittering outline. Down through reaching shards of glass that could slice me open, end to end. And then he goes into the, into the uh, building. There's a few paragraphs talking about what Tobias sees as he flies in and he's flying past a couple of rooms. And then this happens. I turned a corner and practically ran into Axe. I landed on his back, enjoying the respite. Hey, shouldn't you be in some slightly less provocative morph, I asked him. Possibly, but I felt a strong, fast tail might prove useful. So let's get this straight. At the start of this chapter, so just before that, Jake went to Axe and dragged him away from the buffet table at the party. And at the start of this chapter, Jake and Axe parted ways. Jake then walks around the back of the building, picks up a breeze block, smashes the window, because that's how they're getting into the building. Tobias immediately swoops down through, into the building he goes, turns a corner and lands on Axe, who's demorphed to Andalite. That just... It doesn't make sense because how it doesn't make sense in, in a lot of ways. OK, and it's just, just a bloody stupid moment. OK, so how the fuck has Axe got there? How has he had time to demorph? Why has he demorphed in the middle of this community centre where there's all security? Just every question has a wrong answer. <laughs> there is no right answer. It's just bullshit. Bullshit. What a stupid bloody moment. That's the worst part of this book. And possibly one of the worst, hence why it's three on this list, one of the worst plot moments in the whole series. It just, within the space of a page, there's just, the plot is ruined. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> and yeah, you could say maybe I'm exaggerating that, but this community centre has got high security and Axe has just apparently sauntered in and demorphed in the middle of the corridor, which means that the security is really shit and all the security measures are bull bullock uh, bollocks. So, uh, yeah, it just ruins it all. And then the book continued to be ruined elsewhere as well. Let's move on. And another returning book. At number two on this list, we welcome back number 37, The Weakness. Now, again, I'm not going to read from it because this part of the book is torn in half and I'm just going to... I'm not going to risk tearing it again. OK, so Rachel indirectly caused the death of an old man. There were a series of moments after that which were just awful. Firstly, she denied it and blamed other people. Oh, you, you, this is your fault because you decided that I should be leader, even though I basically decided that I should be leader. Yeah, Rachel is awful in this book, by the way. It's a complete bully, a complete psychopath, basically. But the worst part of it was, at the end of the book, she goes to the, the guy's funeral and talks to his grandkid. And you'd think that she'd have some moment of, look what I've done, you know, I feel great remorse for this. But no, this kid just turns around and says, oh, I didn't care about him. And Rachel's like, cool, that makes everything all right. That is fucking offensive. <laughs> I'm not one of these people that goes around saying freaking everything is offensive like, I don't know, people on Twitter do. 
This book has colour green on it. I'm offended. No, I don't do that, bollocks. But that's genuinely like, what? That just completely tarnishes her character. There's a shallow, awful character. And to an extent, to my fictional reading side, I find that pretty offensive, considering I'm trying to like this character. Just bad. Bad, bad, bad. Go on the floor again. <laughs> it's been a while since I did that. Feels good. So now, look, before we get to number one, let's cover the two bonus moments. Two moments that almost ended up on this list, but didn't quite. And it's from these two books here. So, in The Sacrifice, we've already added Deus Ex Machina on this list, Deus Ex Bugfighter. This one was Deus Ex James. So they're on a train speeding down a tunnel and they're in, you know, everything's going wrong. And then suddenly James flies in, attacks the opponents and flies back out again and everything's basically fine. On a train in a speeding tunnel, he's not even supposed to be there. What the fuck was that all about? So that's, that was close to being on the list. And from Visser. Hey, Tiggles. My cat. You can hear his little dingle, dingle, dingle. Good boy. From Visser, it was a series of moments. And a, it was a really good book. But the problem was, it promised things that the book just pussied out of. <laughs> this kid here, we're going to shoot him in the head or you're going to... I forget what exactly the details were. But neither consequence happened. They got away with it because the animals came in and busted up the place. Either Visa 1 or Visa 3 shall be killed because of their crimes. And in the end, they, the council just turns around and said, actually, no, fuck that. We're just going to send you off somewhere else. Several times in this book, several moments where they raise the stakes and then just sweep it under the rug and pretend it never happened. And those combined make some pretty bad stuff. So that's almost on the list as well. Number one. The worst moment in the entire Animal series, in my opinion, some of you might have already guessed it, it comes from The Andalite Chronicles. Yes, sue me now, okay? And it's not so much a moment, more of a lack of a moment. It comes in between the second and third part, because it's split into three parts, okay? And I'm not going to read it because there's no point, because there's nothing to read. There's some, there should be something there to read, but it's just not, okay? So, the ship that they're on is being swallowed by a killer asteroid. It's literally being swallowed. <laughs> crunch, crunch, crunch. And there's all these fight... Uh, there's a dome ship over there. Forget the name of the dome ship. There's a bunch of Andalite ships and there's Yerk ships as well. And there's a big space battle. And these meteorites, asteroids are getting involved. And then we cut. End of chapter, end of part. Um, end of the Alaran's choice part. I believe that was the title of it. That finished. And then An Alien Dies, part three comes along. And you'd think it would start with how they're going to get away from these killer asteroids. But no, asteroids are gone. All the other ships are gone. Their ship is falling into a black hole. No explanation. No logical flow. Just a complete change of scenery, of plot. It's shocking and it should never have been published like that. The editor should have said, you see this here? No. Just, just stop smoking the crack. Go back to the writing room and try again. That's what it should have been. And that's why it's number one on my list because it is the biggest offender in terms of plot mishaps in this series. So that is my top 10 worst moments of the series. We've got the bad stuff out of the way. Next video, this coming Wednesday, we're going to have the top 10 best moments. We're going to bring the spirits right back up and celebrate the best stuff that happened in the Animorphs series. So I hope to see you then. Remember to put your best, uh, worst moments for this video. Comment on this video your worst moments of the series, which moments you were really disappointed in, or tell me why I'm wrong about some of the moments I've done. If you can defend the asteroid disappearing stuff, then be, be my guest. I'm happy to be shown the error of my ways. You won't make, you, you, won't, you won't manage it. It won't happen because there is no explanation for it. Anyway, thank you very much for watching and I shall see you on Wednesday for the alternative video. Thank you very much for watching. I shall see you next time. Ta-ra.